Many thanks for staying with us and welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Now, a Nigeria-born British member of the parliament, Kemi Badenoch, on Wednesday scaled the first hurdle in her bid to challenge for the leadership of the Conservative Party, which can clear the way for her to emerge prime minister if successful. However, there are five other formidable rivals that she has to contend with in order to make history. In the meantime, her emergence has been a source of excitement for those who say it's long overdue for a person of African origin to occupy the highest political office in Britain. For others, the satisfaction is just for her being a woman. Joining us now to look at the significance of all of, all of this is Dr. Shola Mos Shobamimu, a lawyer and women's rights advocate on this matter. We will also talk to her about the raging controversy in the United States over the Supreme Court's abo abolition of the rights of women to access abortion. Good morning, Dr. Shola Shobamimu. Good morning. Good. Thank Good you morning. for joining us this morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Right. So let's just get right into it. Could we just let's get your immediate sentiments about uh, Kemi Badenoch's um, aspiration to this office? Let's let's get your immediate sentiments to that. OK, so first of all, I'm not amongst those who are excited for the reasons you've given. <laughs> but let, let, let's let me first of all start by saying that representation is a is a powerful thing. It's a it's a great thing. It's exactly what we've been fighting for, that we must in politics and in every sphere of our society have the right representation, because for the longest time, the norm has been just having white people. So to see that the lineup of ethnic minorities, whether it was Kemi Bagna, Rishi Sunak, Sajid Javid, Nadim Zahawi, to, to, to put themselves forward, representation, that is good. But the next crucial step has to be substance. And so when it comes to substance, the question has to be, why should I vote for you? Because I'm not going to vote and support, for you, support you simply because we share the same race, gender, sex, ethnicity. My vote is way too precious for that because my vote is the most powerful form of a democratic representation that I have. So when we now have this, um, you know, the fact that the list has now come down to Kemi, Rishi, um, Penny, Liz Truss, and um, uh, I believe Tom Tuganak, right? Uh, that It's a good thing that Kemi has been able to come this far. When I say good, I mean in terms of representation, but in terms of substance, I find her wanting. So w when it comes to substance, you have to ask the question, what are your policies? What are your competencies? Why should I lend you my vote? And when you see what Kemi stands for, that for me is that everything I've been fighting against, is everything I've been campaigning against. So whether it's on the issue that she has made the cornerstone of her political career and her campaign for prime minister, her cornerstone is based on culture war, is based on being anti-woke, is based on denying systemic racism exists in the United Kingdom, in undermining LGBT plus rights. This goes against what I believe. So I'm like, there's no, how can I possibly support Somebody who is bringing up issues that I know I stand against. Because if this was a, a different politician, it was a white politician, I did the same with Boris Johnson, I would speak out against them. So when it comes to the fact that we have this next potential, potential ethnic minority, be it Rishi or um, Kemi Bateman, we have to be looking at substance. And I know we, people are excited because, okay, it's an ethnic minority. Okay, it's a woman. Again, that's representation. But you need to be looking at substance, people. You need to be taking a look at, you know, what they stand for, their competences and policies. And if that does not match up with what you believe, how can you possibly support it? Kemi Batenock right now, racist and white supremacists have found a kindred spirit in her because she denies systemic racism exists, because she says things like white privilege should not be taught as a contested fact. Because each time she speaks about Nigeria, if you listen to her when she speaks about Nigeria, she talks about Nigeria in very disparaging tone. Yeah. Just in this recent leadership contest, they asked her a question about energy. And she had to go into, you know, I come from Nigeria where they always take electricity off. That we know, you know, we have issues with electricity, but there was no reason for her to bring Nigeria into that conversation in that context. None of the other contenders speak disparagingly of India, Pakistan or Iraq. So why does she always do this? This is what you should be thinking about. Very correct. Very correct, uh, Dr. Shubba Mimu. I mean, this is something that we have also looked at, you know, without being... Uh, seem to be biased, but of course you are bringing up issues that are relevant. Yes, in Nigeria, people celebrate the fact that 
uh, a Nigerian born uh, has gotten to that level where, you know, it's possible that she becomes uh, the leader of the Tory party and ultimately, hopefully, uh, the prime minister. But then just like you have identified, this is somebody who comes up almost every time throwing Nigeria under the boss. I don't have a problem if, you, if she feels strongly about that. But then the context are not always very um, nice, decent, and tidy. Um, what are yeah. her views, for example, about the role that Britain played in what made Nigeria what it is today? You know, what are her views uh, uh, about the fact that, you know... Let me tell you what her views go are. On, go on, please. <laughs> go on, please. Go on. You know, Kerry Baydard has tried to sell the British Empire as a good thing. Yeah. She basically says that there are benefits to the British Empire and that this should be shared with all and sundry. I'm thinking, I'm sorry, what's she talking about? She also talks about colonialism as in, well, it's a good thing because it's really only the elites that, that, that lost their rights. You know, basically, she's suggesting that individual people in the country that we know today as Nigeria did not have individual rights. She's basically saying that before Nigeria became Nigeria, where we know we had nations, empires, kingdoms, yeah. that individuals did not have rights. You and I know that that is utter nonsense, right? Because she's either suffering from historical amnesia or she is deeply and willfully historically ignorant. And this is me giving her the benefit of the <laughs> doubt, of course, right? Because you do not talk like that without having the real facts. How can you sell the British Empire as a good thing? The British Empire was not good. The only people, the only one that benefited from the British Empire were the white British people, not the nations and kingdoms that were decimated, people that were dehumanized. So for, for us to have... Uh, for us to have Kemi Bagnoff in 2022, 2021, basically saying the words that the racist and white supremacists are saying, that tells you exactly where she stands. And that's why I cannot possibly support her. I mean, I'm not Tory. I'm not conservative. I don't belong to um, any of the main political parties, because as far as I'm concerned, you must earn my vote. Right. But the bottom line is this. I cannot sit here and say that's okay. I would not accept it from Boris Johnson, who I campaigned actively against, because as far as I was concerned, he was a lying, untrustworthy, incompetent, no good, at utter waste of space, and had no business being a prime minister. He brought the office of the prime minister into utter disrepute. So then when I look at Kemi Baydonk or any other ethnic minority, I'm going to be putting the same standard on them. So when you now, when, when we're dealing with the fact that Africa as an entire continent is still being is still being dealt with as though it is backward, unadvanced, that it's, you know, it, it, it's an afterthought. And then you have someone like Kemi Baydonk, who is of Nigerian descent, who is feeding, she's feeding that narrative. I can't accept it. Do we have issues in Nigeria with our politics? Heck yes, who doesn't? They have it here in the United Kingdom. Do we have issues with electricity, utilities? Of course, everybody has their own issues. But every single time she talks about Nigeria, it's disparaging. There was one, um, there, there, there was a response she gave at a press conference where she talked about, you know, I come from Nigeria where I saw politics. Mm -hmm. um, they were so corrupt. Mm -hmm. They were so, I'm like, there's corruption here. Yeah. I mean, Boris Johnson's entire cabinet of incompetence was, I mean, dealt in radio. And when I say radio, I mean like massive corruption. And here you have sit, sitting her there and she's talking about, well, you know, corruption there, but not here. This is why I'm so grateful to the United Kingdom. What kind of mindset is that? I, I, I don't, I, I think Kemi was born in the United Kingdom, actually. I, I'm not sure. Well, this is the thing. There's been, there's been confusion back and forth, Dr. Shola, because uh, officially on, on the internet, it does say that she was born in Wimbledon, southwest London. Yeah. However... Yes. Openly, she's been referred to as being a Nigerian born, whichever the case may be. It is, it, she is going, <laughs> she is suffering, it seems. Though she has successfully made it into the latest round, it's unlikely she'll emerge, unlikely she'll get the backing. So when you look at situations like this, when you've got someone who was 
let's say she was born in the United Kingdom, just like myself, and you have a Yoruba first and last name before you get married, yeah. and you've tried your hardest to clamor up because she talks about working McDonald's. I yeah. too worked in McDonald's as a teenager. <laughs> yeah. So the story people can relate to, especially you know when you are an immigrant yourself or a child of an immigrant, many people can relate to a rags to riches type of effort. Yeah. However, there's something some people have determined as disingenuous when you stand in front of a political party looking for their support, turning your back on your own country. What are your views on immigration? Do you want to keep the door open for other immigrants to reap the benefits that you've yep. been able to do so? What plans do you have for the people in the country who are feeling that the systemic racism in the United Kingdom is permeating through this entire cost of living crisis? What are you going to do about that? So my question to you, Dr. Shara, before this turns into <laughs> anybody running up and down on Kemi Vedenok is... How, what do you think her chances are? It seems as though she's trying to pander to uh, a party that will see her blackness as something that they will be comfortable enough to give her, her back, their backing. Do you think that that is possible for them to see beyond her blackness, even though she's tried so hard to pacify it? Oh, I think the reality here for um, Kerry Baitnock is that the, the likelihood is that she will probably get a very good cabinet position. Um, is the, Tory, the Tory party have done better than other political parties in putting forward ethnic minorities. I think, I mean, let, let's just be frank about that, right? But how would Kemi Bate not stand in a general election? I'm sure that's what you'll be thinking as well. Her, her Black identity that she has so claimed that, oh, I'm not a victim and I reject anybody, you know, seeing me as a victim, is the exact same Black identity she's using to run for office. Do you yeah, see? Yeah. It, it, she, she, she's trying to turn it on its head, but it's not working because that's disingenuous. And she's making it out as though people like me, people like you, who talk about systemic racism, that we are acting like we're victims. Do I look like a victim to you? Do I sound like a victim to you? No. But my experiences are not diminished simply because I don't look or sound like a victim. We are not diminished, our experiences of systemic racism, the fact that these systemic barriers exist does not make, doesn't mean that we present ourselves as victims, it means we need to talk about it. And so what Kemi does in her position is to legitimize the denial of systemic racism. This works beautifully for the far right of those in the, in the Conservative Party and those in the United Kingdom. Now. But when it boils down to it, they're going to be thinking, who will be best placed to win the general election? So I think that the, the population right the momentum that she has is working for her in the party. And that would help her get a good cabinet position. But whether that would you know, drive her to be prime minister, I have very strong doubts about that. Um, and, and that is because they'll be thinking about who's going to win a general election. But let me also add this, that thinking about how she would perform. I mean, if you watch the leadership debate, she presented better than uh, some of the um, contenders. But her responses were shallow. They lacked substance. She was saying things we already knew. She wasn't really, she wasn't speaking to real economic policies. She wasn't speaking to plants. She wasn't laying out anything. But she came across much more confident in her shallowness <laughs> than the others could. You see what I mean? So at the end of the day, I, I think the entire country is watching this. And the fact that Kemi Baynard is running for office does not, is neither, that is not, <laughs> evidence that systemic racism does not exist, which is exactly what people on the far right are, are, are saying right now. So whether she gets to the next best position in, in the cabinet or she becomes prime minister, I think what you will find is, is that Kemi Bagnock is strategically using her black identity, using herself as a voice for the culture war, a voice for the far right to drive uh, her ambition. Ambition is not a bad thing. I mean, Nigerians, we are very ambitious, right? Yes, yeah. And when you talked about, but I, I, your, your ambition should not come at the cost of throwing people under the bus. When you talked about um, things about Kemi that resonate, I was, I was born here too, like Kemi. I, I think she was born here. I'm educated, you know, here too, like Kemi. I also went through my stuff like Kemi. I get it. I'm educated like Kemi. So there's nothing about Kemi Bateman that I personally find 
or inspiring. What I do find is what resonates, but that is where it ends. Because then when it comes to values, when it comes to what we stand for, she and I are not kindred spirits at all. And some people watching this right now will go, oh, you just don't like her because she has a difference of opinion. No, this is not about a difference of opinion. And I think James Baldwin, the American author put it best. He said, we can, love, we can disagree and still love each other, except where the, this, your disagreement denies denies my humanity and basically is promoting my oppression. If that is no longer a difference of opinion, what Kemi Bainock does is racial gatekeeping. Mm -hmm. What she's doing is racial gatekeeping. And that right. I would not stand for. The same energy I used to fight and campaign against racists is what I'm going to use to campaign against what she stands for. All right, Dr. Shalor, I'm reaching desperately for some positives here. I mean, of course, we were having a conversation in the studio before you came on. Uh, let's get a fair assessment from you on her role as former equalities minister. For people on the outside, could you, is there anything you could say she did right or well in that capacity? Are you kidding me? <laughs> L listen, <laughs> Kemi was a former minister of equalities. Do you know what I call her? I call her the minister of no equalities. In her role, she, as I said, she denies systemic racism exists. She undermined LGBT plus rights. And she's meant to be the minister of equality. She did not do anything positive as minister for equalities. That's the point. There's a wide range of issues that pertains to her. She supports the Rwanda policy to take people who are vulnerable and to drive them off to Rwanda, to treat them so inhumanely. How can you do that? This is the same Kemi Bainon who said that the fact that she benefited from um, being born in England at a time that uh, just before the 1983 legislation that changed um, that if you're born in, in England, you can't automatically be uh, mm -hmm. you know, a British citizen. She benefited before that 1983 legislation came through um, from Margaret Thatcher. Then she said, but she supports it. She supports it because it's not sustainable. I benefited as well from being born in a time that being born in the United Kingdom automatically made me a British citizen. But I sure as heck don't like that 1983 legislation. I don't support it. Why should I draw up the ladder that I have benefited <laughs> from? I mean, who thinks like that? Dr. Shola, we also brought you here to discuss abortion. We've had a really yeah, interesting yeah. conversation about Kemi Bedo. I don't, I don't want you to think that we didn't enjoy the conversation because we surely did. But we're also here to talk about this shift over in the United States and what that means. Because if we look at typically religious communities, even here in Nigeria, they may, they may well also agree that abortion is not a good thing. But what the issue at hand is, whether or not you're for or against abortion, the issue is that for those who do want it, they can have it. And if you don't want it, you don't take it. So what do you think has shifted in America so much so that choice is no longer the, the breaker up of an argument like this? Well, Trumpism. Popul you know, the, the populism on the right is what has driven this. And it's very much rooted in religion, far right. They call it Christianity, but that's not a Christianity I recognized. Um, I, I recently said, uh, you know, uh, on a TV interview, because I was in a debate and I said, look, bottom line is this, you know, if abortion is a sin, then it's between the woman and her God. It's none of your business. You need to get off the high horse and they stop dictating to women how they should govern their own bodily autonomy. That is nobody's right or choice. I do not understand this need in America and in the West to govern women's bodies, to dictate to women what their choices should be. You know what? When it comes to this whole reproduction, all right, I say they should they should govern, that regulate the semen, leave the womb alone, okay? Leave, leave women alone and go govern men. Okay, let every man have vasectomy that can be can be that can be reversed leave but you don't want to do that because men want to be able to do and when i say men i'm saying some men okay men want to be able to do what they want and get away with it but let's not forget that there are women who are also supporting this they, they it, it's it, i think it just boils down to this the subjugation of women and this is this has been driven by the republicans and it's been driven by the republicans on a popular wave I don't think it's right. I think it's wrong. I mean, recently we have stories of 10-year-old girls who have been raped 
and not being allowed to have an abortion. I mean, it's unthinkable. It's just pure evil, raped. And, 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 and the interesting thing is, uh, one of the recent discussions they had, uh, I think one of like committees, these pro-lifers said, well, it should not be an abortion. Um, she can go through the surgery, but we would not call it an abortion. I'm like, but that is what abortion means. You're trying to redefine something, knowing fully well it is wrong to make a child go through this. And this is what they're doing. And it's absolutely just, it's ugly. It's inhumane. Here in the United Kingdom, there is no, what we have to do is fight for the right to ensure that it is, you know, in law, that there is that human right for women to be able to, to do this. Well, we do have a right to have an abortion under certain circumstances, right? So it's not as harsh or as bad as United um, United States. But the, the current Justice Secretary, Dominic Rapp, is refusing to put in his so-called new Bill of Rights the right for women to have an abortion, which is very different from what the Abortion Act actually says. The Abortion Act gives access. It, it does not doctrinate the right, the human right to have that. So th therein lies the difference. All right, all right, Dr. Shala, just a quick one before we let you go. I'm sorry that I have to drag you back to uh, the UK and not on abortion. If Rishi Sunak emerges uh, as the Tory leader, do you think that something fundamental will have changed in the UK politics? No, just I mean, Rishi Sunak, I, yeah, Rishi Sunak is running more on an economic policy, right? And he has he said he had fundamental differences with Boris Johnson when it came to the economy and how to drive the United Kingdom out of this economic decline. So his thing is more on the economy. I don't think anything will fundamentally change in terms of policies because the policies are Tory policies, which he also supported. Again, Rishi Sunak is the kind of story that, you, you know, you think of. Um, his grandparents came to the United Kingdom as immigrants and they worked hard. His parents worked hard. He worked hard as well. He's very wealthy now, has a very wealthy wife. All of that. They worked hard. I mean, as long as their wealth is obtained in a legitimate manner, I have no issue with his wealth. What I have an issue with is what he's going to do with the power and influence he gets from being in public office. Now, he will be very different from Boris Johnson because he does not come across as somebody who lacks integrity. I do not agree with the policies that he supported, um, but I think that in terms of policies, nothing will change. This is why I'm saying right now in the United Kingdom, right. it should not be the Conservative Party choosing the next prime minister. We should be having a general election where the entire country is choosing from a pool of leaders who they want to lead next. But yeah, as I said earlier, representation is a good thing and only the Conservative Party seems to be leading on having ethnic minorities as potential um, leaders for their party. And that is a good thing, even though I might not support or agree with their potential leaders. Dr. Shola Moshogbamu, thank you very much for joining us on the morning show this morning. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day.